Welcome to episode 61, The Truth About the Chinese Social Credit Score System. Before we get started, I want to ask you to do me a favor and share the show. If you're on social media and topics such as the Chinese Social Credit Score System comes up, or red flag laws, mass shootings, socialism, or even cryptocurrency, please share the topic-specific TruthQuest episode with your debate partner. And if you're looking for something to agree with each other on, share episode 59 with them. If you are listening to this on the Apple Podcast app, please take a moment and scroll down on the podcast page and give it a five-star rating. Another way you can help grow the show is to throw a small donation my way at the TruthQuest podcast patronage page. See this episode's show notes page at truthquest.podbean.com. The easiest way to stay up to date on the podcast, easiest way to stay up to date on the podcast is to subscribe to it on iTunes or Google Play Music. It's also available on Stitcher, Spotify, and Podbean. And finally, the video versions of the podcast are available on YouTube and bitshoot.com. And of course, please join the conversation on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash truthquestpodcast. China's social credit score system has been in the news lately. One story in particular caught my attention. It reported a recent tweet by the Global Times as it joyfully reported, quote, five, six million discredited entities from purchasing plane tickets and 90,000 entities from buying high-speed rail tickets in July, end quote. The more I learned about this, the more I saw its implications in America, or any Western country for that matter. Is something like that the future of how all governments will control their subjects? Who needs laws and courts and constitutional rights when you can be steered, jeered, and cajoled by a social credit score? So what is this social credit score? As described in a recent Fast Company article, it is, quote, a technology-enabled, surveillance-based, nationwide program designed to nudge citizens towards better behavior, end quote. The goal is to allow the so-called trustworthy citizens to live life normally with some government-granted benefits, while making it difficult for the discredited to do the same. The government publishes red lists or black lists as rewards or punishments for the trustworthy or uns- for the trustworthy or untrustworthy. In essence, it steers the behavior of Chinese individuals, businesses, social organizations, and government agencies. Virtually everything Chinese citizens do is monitored and fed into a vast data processing system that computes citizenship scores for each individual. This process is facilitated by a vast collection of closed-circuit TVs throughout the country. Some reports suggest that there are over 170 million cameras, most with facial recognition software. This social credit score is akin to the financial credit score that your mortgage broker pulls up when you go to buy a home and get a loan. But instead of deciding if you are allowed to borrow money, this system increasingly decides if you can do anything. As I briefly discussed in episode 60, Chinese citizens are punished by having their social credit score lowered for engaging in a number of different behaviors, including bad driving, smoking or playing loud music on trains, pay debts, excessive video game playing, late payments, failing to sweep the sidewalk in front of your house or store, jaywalking, buying too much drunk food, buying too much alcohol, walking your dog without a leash, letting your dog bark too much, calling a friend who has a low credit score, having a friend online who has a low credit score, posting fake news online, criticizing the government, visiting unauthorized websites, sitting in a reserved seat on a train, not paying a court bill, traffic violations, stealing electricity, or not stopping at a crosswalk. You can also be awarded for such things as charitable donations or even taking your parents to the doctor. Folks with lower scores are limited in their ability to rent, book a hotel room, buy gas, get hired for high visibility jobs, buy a train or airline ticket, their children are not allowed to attend private schools, they can't buy property, and they even sometimes get slower internet get slower internet connections. On the other hand, benefits to those with higher scores include better interest rates, university admiss- admittance, higher visibility on dating apps, expedited travel applications, discounts on energy bills, and the ability to rent things without a deposit. So now, I know mo- many of you are thinking, why the hell should I care about what's going on in China? It's a communist country that uses and abuses their people. After all, we have the constitution that protects us from unscrupulous government activity. First of all, 
If you have listened to more than a handful of the Truth Quest podcast episodes, you will recognize that we clearly are living in a post-constitutional era. Throughout my episodes, I repeatedly pose the question, where is that in the Constitution? About a host of topics, from abortion and the very existence of most federal agencies, to the Patriot Act and Obamacare, to Social Security and welfare, to gun control and the Federal Reserve. These are all legal realities that are by no means powers enumerated in the Constitution to the federal government. Yet we are, for some ungodly reason, subject to those clearly unconstitutional dictates from on high. Second of all, stop and think about all of your activities that are currently being tracked, recorded, and collected. The NSA spying is already sucking in all of our phone activity. Our online and offline buying habits, our viewing habits, and reading habits are all tracked and captured somewhere. What else? Our credit and debit card transactions, our IRS records, even our license plates are tracked at some, in some locations. Most of our workplaces capture our badge swiping as we enter and exit our place of work. There are cameras everywhere in public areas, some of which are being loaded with this facial recognition software. Our driving habits are tracked with GPS trackers. Our uses of toll roads are captured. Pictures of our, pictures of our homes are captured for Google Maps. Not to mention the plethora of publicly available information like the price we paid for our homes and other publicly available tax records. Our phones have location settings that capture our comings and goings. There are millions of doorbell and security cameras. Our email conversations, our instant message conversations are all captured. Our social media posts. Hell, through these ancestry discovery companies, even our DNA is sitting on a server somewhere in the cloud. Have you heard the chatter about a cashless society? Why do you think politicians want to do away with cash? More records of our transactions, of course. What about digital medical records? I mean, come on. Every aspect of our lives, maybe with the exception of our sex lives, private medical conversations, and drug dealing, is captured and stored somewhere. Now, I only mentioned those last three because it was reported in the news just today, as I was put, that contractors at Apple were listening to recordings of Apple iPhone users doing all of these things. For some reason, Siri would get triggered and bam, someone is listening to your most intimate and or illegal conversations. Do you see where I'm going with this? We already have a highly charged, almost combative attitude towards people with different political views that pervades our society. We've seen people use their political power to silence, harass, and impugn their political foes while ignoring the crimes of their political allies. Obama did it with the IRS, Jim Comey did it with the FBI's treatment of Hillary Clinton, the disgraced Mueller investigation into Russian collusion in the 2016 election was essentially a political witch hunt at best, or a silent coup at worst. Are you familiar with Dinesh D'Souza, the conservative author and film rent maker? He was convicted of a crime because he donated too much money to a political campaign. Despite pleading guilty, the liberal federal judge overseeing the pleading guilty, the liberal federal judge overseeing the case sentenced to D'Souza not only to prison but to years of mental health counseling despite a licensed psychologist saying that he was mentally healthy. Think about the deplatforming and shadow banning that goes on on social media. The list is growing eerily long these days. It started out with the likes of Milo Yiannopoulos and Alex Jones. Then people like comedian Owen Benjamin got slapped. Commentators like Laura Loomer, Paul Joseph Watson, and I think even Tommy Lauren has been slapped a few times. Even actors like James Woods, who dares speak ill of anything left-wing, gets booted off of social media platforms. Are you familiar with the practice of doxing? It is essentially a publication of private information about an individual or an organization. The point of which is to put public pressure on them and invite harassment in their direction. Just last week, Texas Democratic Representative Joaquin Castro published a list of Trump donators in San Antonio, his home district. On his official re-election Twitter account, he posted the names of businesses, professions, and Twitter handles of people who allegedly donated the maximum allowable support to Trump. Oh, the travesty. Imagine that. His Twitter post read, quote, Sad to see so many San Antonians as 2019 maximum donors to Donald Trump. Their contributions are fueling a campaign of hate that labels Hispanic immigrants as invaders, end quote. Now keep in mind, this guy is running for the Democratic nomination for president. It's bad enough that he's a congressman. 
if he's willing to do this shit before he gets in office, what would he do once he gets there? People bitch and moan about Trump's abuse of power? Give me a break. What about the closing of PayPal and Patreon accounts of people with offensive ideas? You know, freaks like Dave Rubin and Jordan Peterson. Talk about two radical voices that must be shut down. What about banks refusing to do business with gunmen? My point of this is there are already enough bad actors out there willing to shut down outside voices. There are already plenty of examples of unjustified, suspicious, vindictive, and politically motivated prosecutions and harassment going on today to paint a picture of what's to come if people in power, in government, get their hands on personal data of their political foes. Think what this Joaquin Castro would do if he not only had a list of your political donations, but your tax returns, your online buying habits, and your medical records. It's a recipe for personal destruction. It's a recipe to silence free speech. It's a message, much like the Chinese government, of do not fall out of line with the party or else. The social scoring system essentially enables government to circumvent due process. Think about it. Just like red flag laws and civil asset forfeiture and the no-fly list and shadow banning and deplatforming, there are no legal proceedings. Proceedings. There's no appeals process. You are just deemed discredited as the Chinese do for their low-score citizens. It's one thing if Uber or Airbnb allow the rating of their customers and ban those who are repeatedly abusive, rude, or disruptive. These are private companies who have a right to pick and choose who they do business with. You can make similar arguments for social media sites that ban certain people, but they run into a legal issue because they're exempted from libel suits that come from posts made on their platform. See, they are by law exempt because they are not considered a publisher, but now they're acting as one by picking and choosing who can use their platform. The ongoing Prager University lawsuit against YouTube will hash this issue out in the future. I've even seen where Facebook will block a post of what they consider controversial content. For example, a few months ago I replied to a Facebook friend's post about climate change. I simply put a link to episode 7 of my podcast on that very topic. topic. Facebook blocked it and would not allow it to post, saying, quote, Facebook science does not agree with the content you posted. Well, who the hell is Facebook science? And who gives a shit what they think? What about what YouTube has started doing? Have you seen this? If you post something controversial, climate change, abortion, mass shootings, Julian Assange, socialism, they are now putting links under your video to alternative sites that present a differing viewpoint. You know, the correct viewpoint. And as you likely can imagine, this is mostly done to conservative or libertarian-leaning content providers. So what does this have to do with social credit scores? It's just a sneak peek into how this type of censorship can manifest itself. It's one thing when private companies do it, quite another when the government gets into bed with big tech and gains access to all of the privately collected information, all of the privately collected information on hundreds of millions of Americans. So, what's the takeaway? Well, I'd say it's awareness, it's pushback, opposition, it's talk about this stuff, spread the word, educate others. Given the amount of personal information collected on each of us, the idea of it being consolidated by government is beyond scary. Be vigilant. As I quoted the Tenth Amendment Center in episode 60, the one about red flag laws, we must oppose the disease from the beginning. A social credit scoring system definitely qualifies as a disease worthy of eradication from the start. Please join the conversation on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash truthquestpodcast.